uh, Don McMaster should uh, this his talk should be listened because it is his really final final presentation. This is final. I'm graduating in December, so this is it for me. It's the last presentation. All right. Woohoo! So you won't have to hear about this anymore. So. <laughs> um, all right. So in case you don't know, though, basically what I'm trying to do is reverse engineering framework. Start out. I was playing around with this laser. And uh, basically, I haven't worked on that for a while, but it's still kind of in the back of my mind as I work on this. Ultimately, I'd like to build a decompiler, but in the intermediate, I've been building something like, sort of like IDA, is sort of what it's heading towards, if you ever use that. It's basically just kind of disassemble some uh, unknown binaries and do some sort of intelligent analysis on it. Uh, this semester, what I basically said I wanted to try to do was to get a uh, sort of a GUI up and going, because everything had been command line based before that. Uh, to try to do a license scanner tool, that is, uh, to build upon, I did some function recognition capability last semester, and the idea was that I could take, uh, let's say, generate some signatures for some GPL library code, and then scan some uh, Windows software or, or something of that sort, and say, oh, look, it looks like there's a GPL violation because we can see, based on the signature detection, that it looks like some GPL code was linked in. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to try to do was get a plug-in, uh, sort of an event system going. And the reason being for this, the event system had to do with the GUI because uh, I played around briefly and it looked like it would, it would be good if I could have some way to push out data instead of pulling it always, just because that's kind of the way the GUIs worked. Uh, and the plugin system was to try to modularize code more and make it so third party uh, people, other parties could work with my application easier. Uh, and then along the semester, I also ended up doing was uh, getting a Python API working. Uh, getting unit testing a lot better than it was before is very basic. Uh, working on the library recognition and function recognition capabilities some more from last semester. And I'm also working on a paper related to that, which I'll talk about briefly. Uh, so as far as the GUI goes, this didn't get as far as I wanted to, but I did get a very basic GUI, which I'll show briefly. Uh, and uh, it's QT based, and um, basically what happened was, I found out quickly that in order to get large disassembly listings, hexadecimal, you know, sort of binary dumps, you can't just render everything ahead of time, which is what the first revision does. Uh, you basically need to render things on demand. And I kind of looked into this, asked some people around, and I got an idea of how I need to do this, but uh, I didn't get the time and effort that I, I needed to actually finish this. Uh, partially, someone asked, said they might be able to help me with it, and they got too busy and weren't able to help. So maybe over this winter break, then, I'm going to read it or actually not even break anymore. In the future, I will get a chance to uh, revisit this and uh, hopefully I'll finish that up. Uh, so briefly, this is kind of what the GUI looked like. It's just a very basic. This is kind of where it's assembles. That's just some of the functions I detected. There's just a very basic disassembly listing you can scroll and then sort of a notification log area on the bottom. And I'd like to get it much, much more advanced than this, but this was kind of like bare minimum of what you would need for something useful. Uh, so the next thing I was trying to work on was, uh, was to get this uh, license scanner uh, working. And um, also part of other things happened. I wasn't able to put as much effort into this as I would like to. Um, as I develop some of the, uh, as I've been developing more and more of the library and function recognition though, I've gotten closer. Part of this also was uh, I had been talking to some people and they were concerned about certain legal issues with the way I was doing something. Uh, I think I have those worked out now, especially since I'm just doing the GPL code for now. This uh, shouldn't be an issue. Um, and so this is something I'm going to have to continue to work on. So most of the effort this semester actually focused on this item right here. Was basically to, to make the code uh, flexible um, and sort of uh, make it so other people could use it. So what this involved was before was the core was very large. It, it had basically all the functionality in there and one giant library. Uh, I remember after debug, it, it gets pretty large anyways. And for people developing code, looking over it, there might be a lot of code in there that they just honestly don't need to look at. Some weird dependencies, all that sort of stuff. So what I tried to do is I said, okay, I have some, you know, some elf object format parsing code that was in one directory. I said, well, that should be an object plugin. I mean, this is what it does. It parses an object, it, it provides some APIs to access the object's functionality. So move that to library. And it did, did the same thing for binary loaders. I had some code that works with uh, bin utils, there's like libbfd and stuff, move that out. Uh, and so kind of a list of uh, some of the plugins. Basically, uh, there's one I did that uh, generates ASCII art. It was just kind of a test plugin. It was just kind of because I was bored, really. Uh, the other ones are real plugins, though. So there's one that uh, is kind of a configuration file-based disassembler, which was something I've been working on. 
One of them works with uh, bin utils, which is like object dump and object copy and all LD, all those ones you've probably worked with before, using the same functionality as them. Uh, the L file loader that I wrote, um, a library recognition <coughs> framework, which is uh, Hectrace Flirt is the algorithm. I was playing around with Game Boy uh, stuff, so I started working on, I have a Game Boy object loader, I was playing around with that. And then finally, a binary object loader, which would be something you just dumped off of, say, uh, the computer in a car. It wouldn't have an object file. It would just be a raw binary file with no header information or anything of that sort. Uh, and this has definitely improved the code uh, because now it's, it's a lot easier to see dependencies. Uh, I can make changes without affecting the rest of the code so much. And just kind of when you're looking over stuff, it, it's a lot less intimidating because you only see the core, uh, I just call them the switching logic, and you don't have to worry about all these specific implementation details anymore. Uh, and then, so one of the things I was working on was the, uh, the library recognition. And there was a couple of bugs that were left over from the summer, and I, I, the previous semester I fixed those. Uh, now this got moved to a plugin, so I think it's a lot more maintainable now. Uh, unfortunately, there, there's still a couple small issues. Uh, one is that uh, sometimes you get signature collisions, which is actually the topic of the paper, which I'll talk about briefly. And uh, so I need a way to easily resolve that. Basically, these have to be manually resolved right now by adding a text file, which isn't too bad, but it can be streamlined a little bit more. Uh, you know, have some sort of dash dash, you know, automatically uh, discard all collisions, sort, sort of something of that sort. Uh, right now, all it does is it, I believe it actually adds all the collisions as duplicates, which might not be so bad, but I'm not sure how Ida would handle that, because I believe its signature writing tools can't do that, but since I wrote mine, and the data format strictly allows that, it might just cause the program to crash. I'm not actually sure, so that's something to look into. Uh, and also, since I was mostly trying to do a clone of their toolkit and not the actual usage, most of the work in this right now has to do with creating these data formats. Uh, and I'm not actually using them to do the decompiling and stuff, which I actually could. Uh, it wouldn't be that much work, I just haven't got a chance to do that. So that's something to go into in the future. Uh, as part of this, what I said was, uh, I was at an uh, interview at uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratories, and, um, and I did malware analysis for them over the summer, and they asked, uh, so now that you know all this about the way these library recognition algorithms work and function recognition, uh, do you think that these are safe to use if we're using malicious software? And I said, well, well no. Uh, I can tell you that my experience shows that these are not very resistant at all. They said, well, why is that? And unfortunately, we didn't really have much time to talk about it. But they said it would be something that they'd be very interested in. I know some other people have kind of claimed this, but no one's proven it. So I'm going to go out and prove that. I'm going to say, this is reason A, B, C, why, why these aren't. And that paper is pretty much at a rough draft stage right now. I have the proof of concept working. I show that you can trick this very, very expensive analysis framework with very little effort. So, uh, so that'll be something up and coming. Uh, another thing I worked on was I got a Python API working, and that was using Swig. And uh, basically, what Swig's objective is, is you just give it a header file from you know, C, C++, and it spits you out Python, Ruby, Lua, whatever bindings you need to use. In this case, I'm focused on Python, but without too much effort, you could probably generate them for Ruby and all these other languages, too. Uh, one of the big limitations I found, though, is a little bit complicated to deal with all the plugins now, because it pretty much expects you're generating them for one library, and there's some weird casting issues and all this sort of complicated stuff. Then when you get multiple of these together, I think for now what I'm probably going to do is generate for, for the, the main core and all the plugins, which will mean that you'll have to have all the plugins available. You don't have to use them necessarily, uh, but that'll at least get me blanket Python support. Because ultimately, you want to be able to use specific features of ELF files and all that. And without this sort of functionality, you just have the generic object interfaces, which isn't enough in a lot of cases. Uh, another thing was I improved unit testing. I had some unit testing before, but it was very basic. Uh, it's based on CPP unit. Now I broke it up into a lot more uh, test suites, uh, better options. And I also looked a lot into continuous integration testing servers, but uh, unfortunately I couldn't really get C dash working as well as I'd hope. So I just have some quick hacked up Python thing that took an hour or two to write. And at least for now that seems to be working. It's a lot better than having nothing. Uh, miscellaneous improvements there was, uh, because of the plugin architecture, it really put a lot of stress on the way objects were linked and stuff, so I made sure that that's a lot smoother now. I broke in some of the programs, or some of the functionality was kind of hacked into some of their programs, so I tried to move those out to their own program so it ran a lot smoother. I, uh, I deleted a lot of code after the plugins, it eliminated the core code, I could see a lot of things were not being used. 
Uh, and as part of that too, there were some design decisions I'd made early that I thought would be a good idea for abstractions, but it turned out they were kind of over designs. So I went and simplified those, made them to more basic forms, and then if later I need those features I thought I might need in the first place, I'm going to go back and add them because they ended up costing a lot, causing a lot more damage than they did help. Uh, and finally, I'd been storing the presentations in the repository, which seemed like a good idea at the time, but unfortunately, because of all the pictures and stuff, uh, it made the, the rip, the repositories, much bigger than they need to be. Uh, so I learned how to do hard git deletes, which was something interesting. Because usually you're only supposed to delete files in git, and I actually learned how to completely destroy them from the repository. Since git clones the entire repository, you'd still have those files in the history for a checkout. So that was kind of interesting. Uh, and then finally, moving on, what I'm going to try to do uh, is I want to fix the GUI issues. It's something I really think this project would take off if I had a solid graphical interface on top of it. Uh, so that's something I, I really want to hammer on. It's been hard, but I think if I put a lot of effort into it, I'll get something out there. I would like to uh, make the object files plugins to be more regular. Basically, each time I tried to accomplish something I would, uh, for a you know, personal project, I would implement that little bit of functionality I would need to get that thing done. But what I really should do is I should go across, look at what, what are the uh, functions that people expect to be implemented in all objects, and uh, object formats that is. Go across there and make sure those are all implemented. For example, you always want to be able to get all the list of functions from an object file. You can do that on some formats, but not others. I should go sure and make sure those interfaces are all consistent. Uh, I kind of mentioned the Python that I want to kind of improve that a little bit, the way it hates plugins. And then finally, there's kind of a, uh, I think it's pretty annoying, there's a single, singleton uh, sort of object issue. Basically, my code started out as C code a long time ago, and uh, just kind of the way that C kind of encourages you to do things. Uh, I had a, uh, there's a single, singleton sort of object with some global references, and at least I want to eliminate that for the engine object. I might keep the uh, configuration object as global, that is basically the style you print uh, some, uh, maybe like if you like hexadecimal with OX prefix sort of stuff. And basically the reason for that is is that uh, there's a lot of lightweight objects that need to do printing and stuff, and it would be a big burden to do this configuration. And you probably want this consistent across the entire program anyways. Uh, but you might want to have, for example, uh, two DLLs loaded con uh, concurrently or something. I believe IDA, the main product that I'm kind of going off of, I think they have a singleton object model. Uh, but I'd have to verify that. In any case, that doesn't mean it's right, so I would like to look into that and fix it. So thank you for listening. That was the final presentation. Uh, any questions? Uh, anything like that? Yes, Peter. So I have a couple of questions. Um, yes. <clears throat> I really don't want to hammer on the GUI that much because you mentioned you didn't have that much time to work on it. Um, I mentioned you were having some... Oh, no, this is, this is like, can I do cute work? Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned you were having some text rendering issues because you wanted to be able to only... You didn't want to load all the, you know, 100,000 yeah, so, lines. So I talked to, to various people, and I got a very strong, what I need to do is use QAbstract scroll widget and uh, implement a custom version of that. Uh, and then I wanted to ask you about your plugin framework. Yeah. Um, how mature and ready is that for, you know, if I wanted to write, like, an iPhone plugin or something like that? Well, you know? the question is, though, is without the graphical user interface, though, is how usable would it be, even if it worked? <laughs> I, I, that, that's kind of what, from my perspective, how things would kind of stand. I mean, would, would you want it to be able to do mad, you know, command line options, looking through and figuring that stuff out? I mean, if, if you can't do it interactively, it, it's kind of a hassle. But in that respect, uh, I would also say it's still somewhat developing, uh, and I'm in the process of, of getting those interfaces more and more done. So, you can talk afterwards, depending on what you want to do, we might build here. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, I'm slightly familiar with C-Dash, because I worked at Kitware over the summer, but yeah. if you want um, some implementation help. If someone could, yeah, some help. If you email Ben Bakel. Um, so, they actually contacted me, because I talked to uh, Dan Ibanez, I guess his name is. Uh, yeah, that's Luis's son. Yeah, and uh, a few hours after that, I got a, uh, a message from uh, Kitware saying, we hear you're playing around with C-Dash. Yeah. Um, I forget their name, but but uh, <laughs> they, they're, they're, uh, they're actually, that was part of the problem. They didn't email me. They posted on the my blog saying, we, we see you having kitware problems. And I honestly have no contact information for them, except to keep posting back on the blog. So that's kind of annoying. Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, um, just when I saw your QT thing, yeah. and uh, I've only used QT a few times, but like my first intuition was Q abstract tree model, because it's mostly like, you're saying it's all column row based, the data. 
I don't know anything about QAbstract. I can look into that. Just implement like say it has rows and it has columns, and you yep. implement like the get row column, and it handles the whole view 